Fox Mark 7 is out as a fully public release now and is ready to go into production after a fairly short beta I did a video on recently. In this video I'm going to be kind of doing a more overall review on Proxmox 7, taking a look at it, taking a look at it on a freshly installed system, and also taking a look at upgrading my main server from Proxmox 6.4 to 7 to see what sorts of issues I had with it. I'm also going to just be kind of looking at the landscape of hypervisors and similar products to see how Proxmox lines up with the other ones. Let's first take a look at what's changed in Proxmox 7 and what the new features are. Overall, it's a pretty small change. There isn't any major drastic feature changes, the UI is about the same, and the overall kind of design is basically the same as Proxmox 6.4 which came before it. The full feature log change is on the wiki, or here it is on the screen right now. Now if you use any of these features and like the upgrade, this might be a massive change for you, but for what a lot of what I do, it's a fairly minimal incremental upgrade. The biggest change is a lot of the under-the-hood software Proxmox uses has been updated to a newer version. So the Debian version under the hood has been changed from Debian 10 to Debian 11 Bullseye, which adds many updated features, so like a lot of newer system utilities, since Debian does generally run a lot of an older version of those utilities. ZFS has been upgraded, which adds a few new features and attributes, and things like ZSTD compression. Um, Ceph has been updated, so there's newer feature sets if you use Ceph. Camu and KVM have both been upgraded, adding their newer feature sets. And there's a newer Linux kernel running under the hood, version 5.11, which provides support for newer hardware, and just has a lot of other smaller improvements. Some of the smaller features that have been added to Proxmox 7 that stand out to me include BTRFS as a technical preview. Kind of a fan of BTRFS, so I'm glad to see that now you can use snapshots. Better backup and restore capabilities. So now it gives you a bit more granular support with more prominent prune instead of the how many backups you want to keep. Also there's an option to encrypt your backups. Those are some of the smaller changes that I kind of like and make things that I work with easier. But there's a long list of other small changes which might improve your workflows depending on how you use Proxmox in your environment. It basically just made Proxmox a bit better in a lot of little areas and just kind of helped modernize a lot of the code under the hood and the versions that were being used. Um, it won't really make it a fundamental shift of how it fits into the market of hypervisors and its competition though. Speaking of the market and its competition, let's kind of look at the hypervisor market and what else is there out there and how Proxmox competes with it. So of the hypervisors that you can kind of install on commodity hardware and use, there's a few options today. Um, VMware's ESXi, um, Microsoft's Hyper-V, Proxmox. Um, Citrix Zen and the other open source versions based off the same code base are what I'd consider to be the main ones in use these days. There's a lot of other smaller projects, but they're often built on the same hypervisors under the hood, normally either KVM or Zen for them. Kind of commercial products, VMware's ESXi and Hyper-V kind of seem to be the biggest one. And I think that's where some of Proxmox's disadvantages come from. Since they are a smaller player in the market, a lot of the times when you download a pre-made VM image, they don't have a Proxmox option. You get a VMware image and you get a Hyper-V image. And they work just fine on those platforms, but if you want it to work on Proxmox, you either have to install from the ISO or convert their images over to something Proxmox can use, which can make it a bit more annoying. Also, a lot of kind of commercial software like Veeam for backups doesn't support um, Proxmox or many of the other open source ones, just due to partially the smallest size. Luckily, Proxmox has kind of worked to improve this via doing solutions like having the Proxmox backup server, which provides a lot of those same backup features. But if you're in an environment where you need to rely on a lot of third-party software to make your hypervisor to its full potential, Proxmox probably won't be there for you, or you're going to have to do a good amount of legwork writing scripts or programs for it to fill your needs. On the other hand, Proxmox has a lot of really nice advantages that I like about it. First of all, it's based off Linux, and they really aren't afraid to say that. A lot of their guides show you how to do it in the command line, and if you're fluent with the Debian or Linux systems, it works quite well, and it's also quite easy to script a lot of their commands fairly easily in a simple Python or Bash script. So if you want to add a little functionality that Proxmox doesn't have or a third party doesn't make, you can often make it pretty easily on your own, which is great to see. Also, a lot of the times when I've broken stuff in Proxmox, it's pretty easy to go into a config file and fix. 
For example, a lot of the lock files and stuff are just files you can delete and not some part of the database you have to dive into. And I find it very easy as someone who is reasonably good with Linux to kind of go in there and fix stuff instead of having to find another solution app. I've broken Proxmox a couple of times and I found it so I can almost always fix it on my own. There also is still a quite large community for Proxmox with any of the issues I've had, someone else has had, and they have a fix for it. So it's definitely not too small that you can't find fixes or solutions out there on the net for you. One of the other big advantages of Proxmox is they have a free no subscription option with basically the full features of the standard version. A lot of the other paid software like VMware is they kind of have a free version but it's pretty limited. With Proxmox I could take the free version, put it on a cluster of systems, start hosting things with high availability and a hyper-converged system without paying for anything or dealing with software licenses, which I think is really great. And it also helps home labbers and stuff get into it and also start you from kind of a free system. And if you want to grow, you can pay for support and you can kind of move up support tiers as needed. Whereas a lot of the other paid software, it's kind of you need three grand or whatever the price is for the environment to even start using it and get the full potential out of your hardware. They're also just less picky about hardware which is great for kind of the home lab of I want to run it on something. So sitting in front of me is four different systems, like a used business desktop, kind of one of these tiny mini micro systems, an old laptop, and a used enterprise server. And all of these run Proxmox fine. Many of these are quite old systems with relatively limited hardware and Proxmox runs on it. I've ran Proxmox on like Core 2 Duos of 4 gigs RAM and it runs fine. And also you've ran it on pretty high-end dual Xeon, quad Xeon systems with hundreds of gigs of RAM and it also runs fine on there and is able to reach the full potential of the hardware. And I'm happy of how easily it can scale. One smaller disadvantage of Proxmox is it is kind of a Linux first hypervisor in a way. So a lot of things work better with Linux guests than they do with Windows guests. For example, containers are Linux only and some things like the RAM sharing feature, vert IO drivers and stuff just work a bit smoother in Linux than they do in Windows. Windows definitely works fine in Proxmox, but it often takes one or two more steps to get working than a Linux VM would. And when using a kind of a Windows first hypervisor like Hyper-V, those steps aren't required for Windows, but often they might be required for Linux. So if you're doing a primarily Windows hypervisor setup, I'd probably look a little bit more into Hyper-V than Proxmox, and Proxmox makes a lot more sense if you're doing a primarily Linux setup with some Windows. One of the other things I really like about Proxmox is how easy and well it does clustering, especially at a smaller scale. Proxmox, unlike some of the other hypervisors, don't really have a master node at all for doing clustering or don't really require any previous setup. So if I had this system here running a few Proxmox VMs and I wanted to expand to another node like this little guy, I could basically put Proxmox in it plug it up into the network and just tell it to reach out and add it with the credentials. And now I can see all the VMs with both of them on one screen, migrate VMs without even having to do shared storage. Now that I've looked at the new features of Proxmox 7 and taken a look at some of the pros and cons of Proxmox compared to VMware ESXi or other products on the market currently, let's go throw Proxmox on some of these systems I have here, see how the installer goes, see if there's any issues I run into, and just kind of see how it overall works. Now let's take a look at the install process for Proxmox 7. So I have my system booting into the installer right now, and the installer is largely the same, especially to a person installing the OS. There's a few changes under the hood and improvements have been listed like better high DPI support, so if you're using like a 4K monitor, things will scale to better utilize your full screen, but that's not really an issue with me as I have only a 1080p monitor. There's a few changes also under the hood with how it manages the updates and the actual installation process, but that really isn't noticeable and it just helps things work a bit smoother under the hood. Overall, I'm quite happy with the Proxmox installer. It's pretty simple and mostly just works. If I had to list a few improvements that I'd love to see, some things would be a network installer, so that would let me actually install all the packages from the network so I don't have to update immediately after an install. Another improvement I'd love to see is the ability to have a primarily text one, something like the basic Debian installer. That way it's a bit easier to install with just a keyboard and I need less mouse or just tabbing to get at what I'd like. 
Going through the installer is pretty simple. It's just agreeing to the license, selecting which drive and how you want to install. I'm going to use one of the new features of Proxmox 7 right now, which is BTRFS. And you get to pick which RAID level you'd like, either 0, 1, or 10 in BTRFS, as in which drives you want. So I'm going to only pick my internal hard drive, and I'm going to click Next. Then you get to pick your country and time zone. Then you get to pick a password and email for your system. One nice thing with Proxmox is I've never had them email me out of the blue. Now we have the network configuration. I'm just going to click install right here and it's going to start installing Proxmox on my system. And that install is pretty painless. It just booted right into it and on the screen it tells you all about that you need to know that you can just open the web page here. On my laptop here I've opened the web page and I've just signed in. I'm just going to do a super quick install. And if I want to just start really fast, I can just go to my volume and just upload a ISO image. Or one of the cool things that Proxmox has added is I can download it from a URL. So I can just give it the URL to download. It'll say download now and that's the full link I can get right here. I can just click copy link, paste it in here. We're going to click query URL and it's just going to save it as uh, ISO. And due to this, I can just save it straight onto the system. I don't need to go out and um, download it to my laptop and then upload it to the system. So this saves me a bit of time. And since I'm lucky with fast internet, this is only going to take about two minutes to do a full download and it's ready to use. I can also download container templates from a URL or I can use one of the provided Proxmox templates. And now that my ISO is finished downloading, creating a VM is super simple. I can just click create VM call it like Ubuntu um, test. They don't allow spaces in here, unfortunately. Um, I can just select that ISO I downloaded, pick information about the system. And like any other virtual machine system, it's kind of how many resources you want and which exact type. I'll probably make a video in the future going over a little bit more of why you'd pick some of these over others. But this is kind of what I generally pick for a generic VM right now. And I'm just going to hit confirm and I can actually click start after created and it's just going to immediately fire up that VM once it creates the config files and the virtual disk is needed. So it looks like my Ubuntu VM is running and it's immediately started up and I can actually boot straight into the live disk on here. So I've been going through the install procedure on the Ubuntu VM. It works just like basically any other um, physical or virtual machine would and just kind of works. Um, some of the advantages of BTRFS is you can do snapshots a bit better. So instead of just doing it as like a QCAL file or something, if I snapshot it uses the BTRFS snapshots. So let's actually do that right now. So I'm just going to call it test1. It'll include the RAM and do a full snapshot. And then in the future, I want to go back to this state. I can tell it to go back. It uses all the BTRFS goodies to do it. BTRFS has a few other cool features where I could just kind of add a hard drive to it if I wanted to and change RAID levels on the fly. Proxmox 7, no bugs I encountered here, very painless. Now, this is a relatively fast system with an SSD 16 gigs of RAM, but I've also ran it on slower systems with like 4 gigs of RAM and a mechanical hard drive. You're definitely limited in terms of what VMs you can run at a given time and what workloads you can do but Proxmox stays zippy pretty much no matter what hardware you throw at. And due to KVM and the Linux kernel and Commute just being designed relatively well, it scales up quite well to very high-end hardware, so I can throw a quad socket system with multiple terabytes of RAM at it, and it's still going to appear snappy, and it'll scale well to the full capable performance of that system. Now I'm going to take a look at upgrading up system running Proxmox 6.4 to Proxmox 7. The system I'm going to be looking at upgrading is my main personal server, which is a Sun X3-2L. This system has about 20 of my personal VMs running at once. It's booted from a RAID 1 of flash drives, and it has a big SSD for VM storage and a few hard drives, so just kind of bulk file storage. And I went through the whole process of doing it, and I'm going to kind of go through the experience I had doing it and roughly how long it took. So I have the um, upgrade guide from Proxmox to take a look at here. I have the Proxmox web interface, and then I also have a command line into the system as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to go hibernate all of my VMs. The other thing I'm going to run first of all is just do a sudo apt update and a sudo apt upgrade. This will make sure I'm running all the newest packages right now. 
and is generally recommended before any upgrade. It also makes sure you have that PVE 6 to 7 script that lets you do that. So it looks like those nine packages I can upgrade now. So I'm gonna run that now. I also realized since I'm running a virtual router on my system, I need to have the router running as a VM to actually upgrade it. So that's gonna make this upgrade a little bit more fun. I've also ran the script to tell me if there's any issues possible with this upgrade. It looks like it actually found a few things all due to my configuration being wrong. A couple of them are due to storage volumes that I've since removed and I guess not removed from Proxmox. And the last one is it says the resolved IP doesn't go to the host. And that's due to um, me changing the IP on the host and not changing all the config files. So I'm going to have to go in and do that now. Looking at my host file, if you change the IP of a Proxmox host, you also have to change it in the slash etc slash host file. Otherwise, it's going to resolve to the wrong IP. And now that I've ran that, I can run um, the 6 to 7 again and it should show me the, um, that I've corrected that. So I have no failures right now. I need to clean up some of my storage, but it does look like I'm ready to do the upgrade. And now I'm gonna follow their guide to updating the repositories. So I'm going to um, update my Debian repositories to Bullseye instead of the Debian 10, adding the Proxmox repository for the new um, Proxmox. And now that I've ran the update script, I can see in slash etc slash app slash sources dot list, all of my repositories say bullseye now. So it looks like I'm ready to go. So I'm gonna exit out of here and then start running sudo apt update to update all the packages to get the new list of packages for bullseye and then sudo apt dist upgrade. The other slightly different config I'm running on my Proxmox server is that I am running it on a USB stick. So that means it's going to be quite a bit slower than a traditional SSD, which I'd say is generally recommended to run it on. So we'll see how it goes. I also have a somewhat limited amount of disk space for on my boot volume. So looking at my root, I only have six and a half gigs available, but I believe that is more than plenty for the Proxmox upgrade I'm running. Now it's time for the reminder. So it's going to tell you it's upgrading version 6.4-1 to 7.0-2 read the upgrade notes, I'm just gonna press enter, and then I likely will get a few more notifications about um, Debian trying to change config files. And it appears that the app dist upgrade is completed successfully, so now I'm gonna just do a sudo reboot, and it's gonna shut down the server, turn it back on, and hopefully it'll have a Proxmox 7 system running as expected once it comes back online. After the upgrade, when I remoted into the system via SSH, I noticed some of the programs have changed. So for example, HTOP now shows a bit different of a program. Also ZFS, because it's a newer version, I can upgrade my existing pools. And that showed me a few new features I could use like ZSTD compression and some other goodies in ZFS. Since I've done the upgrade, I really haven't had any crashes or major issues. All of my VMs ran just fine at boot. Um, I haven't had any stability or performance, major changes. It all overall feels pretty much the same. The web interface just works and I'm pretty happy with the upgrade. The only noticeable issue I had was it did rename some of my network cards as expected in the change logs. Um, it renamed them so that way I had to go into the interfaces file and change them back to what it generated the new names of. After some reboots it does keep these new names though so this shouldn't be an issue until I have to do another Proxmox upgrade. This caused a little bit of confusion for a second as some of my devices that were connected to that network card weren't working until I changed that name. The other thing I noticed when looking at ZFS status is it says I could upgrade my pools. I've since upgraded my pools and now my pools can utilize new features such as ZSDD compression. Overall, the upgrade took about an hour to complete. There was quite a few different prompts for different config files and different options if I wanted to keep them. So I kind of had to keep my eye on the upgrade during the whole time. This upgrade would have been a lot faster if I was running from an SSD or even a hard drive compared to the USB flash sticks I was running. It also was about 700 megabytes of downloads with about two and a half more gigs of hard disk space used or modified. Thanks for watching my review on Proxmox 7. Let me know if there's anything you want me to go deeper into in a later on video on Proxmox or any other questions you have that you want me to investigate in this new version.